Hello everybody and welcome to Toy Two to You Curator's Corner episode number 44. My name's Sean Brosnan, I'm a curator at Toy Two Otago Settlers Museum here in Dunedin and I'm again making these little stories about Pioneer Otago during the coronavirus lockdown way back in March and just seem to have kept going. Today we're going to leave Pioneer politics behind, well almost, and focus our attention on the place where the Otago Provincial Council was to hold its meetings during its first years. That is to say, the Dunedin Mechanics Institute. An odd looking little building erected in 1852 on the site now occupied by the Captain Cargill Monument at the bottom of High Street. The Mechanics Institute only survived there for 10 years, but in that time it played a vital and useful role for Pioneer Dunedin as a public venue for lectures and soirees, as well as the Provincial Council's debating chamber. But even better for us, it provides an excellent orientation point whenever you see an early photograph of central Dunedin. You can see it here, just poking into the view shown in that earliest known image of the central town area from Bell Hill that dates from about 1857. Now you can see what I mean about it being an odd looking building, square with that hip roof, notable especially for the chimney right in its centre. This makes it really easy to spot and helps identify the location of any other building in relation to it. Here are some other views. This one is looking down from above Rattray Street towards the shoreline, and you can see the Mechanics Institute right there in the centre. Now our print has an 1861 date annotated at the bottom, and that's probably about right. Though as I've said before, you have to take those date annotations on early photos with a grain of salt. Here's another one from more or less the same perspective and with 1862 printed on the image. It's definitely later than the previous photo and shows the dramatic surge of development in Dunedin as a result of the gold rush. Just look at all those ships tied up to the jetty and the new buildings that have sprung up between the dates of the two views. But our focus today is the Mechanics Institute itself. The idea for it was first mooted in mid-1851, and just a few months later, this newspaper advertisement called for builders to tender for its construction. Now it wasn't a particularly large or complicated structure, one storied, mostly wooden, so you might wonder why it took until late 1852 for it to be completed and opened. Well, surprise, surprise, it became collateral damage in the endemic bickering between the settlement's Scottish Presbyterian leadership cadre and their English rivals. Yes, the little enemy. It all started out very promisingly. Mechanics institutes like this were a well-established phenomena in 19th century Britain, and you can see in this advertisement all the positive aspirations set out for the Dunedin version. They were places where working men could educate and improve themselves, and they often attracted patronage from aristocrats and other establishment figures as a worthy object for philanthropy. And so it began in Dunedin, as you can see with the original proposal for a library and reading room, alongside a hall for public gatherings, and a place where lectures and evening classes might be held. Attached to the advertisement was a list of the patrons and members of the committee whose job it would be to build and then run the institute. Now looking at these names, you can see some familiar ones from previous episodes in this series, including some of the central figures, both of the Scottish dominant group, like William Cargill, Thomas Burns and James McAndrew, as well as the little enemy, notably William Valpy, and Judge Sidney Stephen all of whom donated generously toward the fund for the building. So far, so good. But it was someone whose name was not on the list of patrons that set the cat among the pigeons. Charles Kettle, the surveyor, an Englishman identified with the Little Enemy faction, got his nose out of joint at being ignored and not put on that list, and seems to have mounted a campaign behind the scenes that saw other leading Little Enemy figures withdraw their support, including Judge Stephen, Magistrate Alfred Chetham Strode, and William Valpy, though the latter at least generously left behind his very welcome donation of £10 and best wishes for the success of the cause. In any case, it must have been a shortage of funds that held up progress through 1851, though a couple of fundraising lectures were held, and these all attracted bumper crowds and added vital pounds and pennies to the kitty. In due course, in February 1852, blocks of yellow sandstone were observed being piled up on the triangle of grass that marked the building's proposed location. And by August, its construction was well underway. 
It opened with a grand soiree on Monday the 3rd of January 1853. But one question that intrigues me is, who designed it? I mean, it looks so odd. And the newspaper's description of it as, in the Grecian Doric style of architecture, and one of the most elegant buildings in Dunedin, seems rather generous. Now, officially the architect was Daniel McAndrew, brother of James and a genuine trained architect. But the moving force behind the whole project of the Mechanics Institute was actually William Langlands, a builder from Edinburgh who had trained as a designer of gas lamps in Scotland. He was the secretary of the Mechanics Institute committee and his obituary claimed that he did the design drawings for both it and the original Knox Church. And when you look at the latter, which was also a rather odd, lumpy sort of building, as you can see from these images, that kind of adds weight to this claim. There does seem to be a sort of similarity to their style, if you could call it that. And it was here, in the portico you can see at the southern side of the Mechanics Institute, that the candidates for the Dunedin seats on the very first Otago Provincial Council gathered on the 24th of September 1853. And both the successful and unsuccessful candidates now made speeches here, followed, reported the newspaper, by a bonfire and other rejoicings. And this became a tradition for all the elections that followed through the 1850s. So maybe next time you're passing through the exchange, you could take a glance at Captain Cargill's monument and think back to those long ago days when that spot was the centre of Dunedin's political life and the funny little building that hosted it.